Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. My name is Simon Ruder. I'm head of home affairs at the Behavioral Insights team. Crime in the modern era is changing. The Crime Survey in England and Wales tells us that the overall volume of crime is declining and that the nature of crime is changing with internet-enabled crime, crime targeting the most vulnerable, and hate crime, particularly on the rise. This session will split into two parts. The first session will focus on the role of police, how they're adapting to the twin challenge of an era of less resource and the changing nature of crime. The second, the second part will focus on what behavioral insights can tell us about how to respond to the new challenges of the changing nature of crime in the modern era. Before we start though, um, I'd just like to say how pleased I am in particular that we're having this session. So, I'm one of the original members of the Pavel Insights team. I've been doing this a few years now. And I can tell you that honestly, possibly more than any other policy area, it's been difficult to get traction within the area of home affairs to focus on how behavioral approaches can improve policy outcomes. But it's very much down to some of the people in the room today that we're seeing teams in MOJ, home office, and police forces across the country beginning to adapt and consider how we can use insight from behavioral um, approaches to improve outcomes. So, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. He's been referred to as the father of evidence-based policing. In 2001, he was awarded the Benjamin Franklin Medal of the Royal Society of the Arts for his pioneering scholarship in evidence-based policy. His work includes the very famous Minneapolis domestic violence experiment, the Canberra reintegrative shaming experiments, and landmark RCTs on hotspot policing. He's the honorary president of the Society for Evidence-Based Policing, the chair of the Cambridge Police Executive Programme, and is currently the Wolfson Professor of Criminology at the University of Cambridge. He is, of course, Professor Lawrence Sherman. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, the context of massive budget cuts in, in the era of austerity uh, it obviously poses a challenge for police, but I think it is a challenge that is compounded by the commission bias, which um, behavioral scientists recognize in favor of doing something as opposed to nothing, about a uh, very clear, uh, frequent, and um, important problem. Um, even when we may not have evidence uh, that the thing that we are doing uh, is working, um, but I'd like to make the case today that a very large part of the budget cuts that the police have already had in this country could be absorbed uh, by looking at the evidence against what the commission bias leads to, which is a default policy of uh, taking people out of their homes for uh, committing uh, common assault uh, or uh, even crimes without physical contact that have not resulted in serious injury. Uh, but they're transported to a police station, um, five to ten hours of police time is consumed, uh, normally after about five hours in the cells, the offender is told to leave because there's a decision not to prosecute. No, NFA, no further action. They're not told to be good, they're not told to improve their behavior, they're just told to go. And the question, really, that has to be addressed, I think, in this country is what is accomplished by doing that? Uh, we don't have any evidence directly on not doing that uh, in this country, but we have quite a bit of evidence uh, in the United States, um, which begins with the Minneapolis domestic violence experiment. I'll tell you about it briefly. I'll tell you more about the uh, better version of it, which was done in Milwaukee, the much larger sample and much, much tighter uh, implementation of random assignment. Um, and then I'll bring you to the Hampshire experiment that was approved by the Home Secretary and the Director of Public Prosecutions, and which is now demonstrating very encouraging results, except because of risk assessment policy, which itself is not evidence-based, uh, the number of cases eligible for it has been cut back severely, and so an effective program is being denied to uh, literally thousands of uh, victims. 
I want to tell you about work of other teams, including a very interesting uh, experiment in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, that worked when the offender had already left the premises, uh, but not when the offender was there to be taken to the jail cells. And I want to tell you uh, about some of the uh, sobering findings from the, the replications of all of these things that I think leads us to the conclusion that absent uh, evidence in the UK that the current process of taking people to the jail and then letting them go, or in a minority of cases actually prosecuting, uh, but then having the charges dropped, and so almost nobody getting any formal sanctioning for domestic violence. Uh, all of this evidence, I think, leads us to a question of whether we could be saving a lot of money that we could be using on child sexual abuse investigations, which are massively expensive, very important, uh, involve much more severe uh, uh, allegations in some cases. Um, all of this is a question we can have because uh, we have a wonderful police chief who went to a city council and said we need to randomly assign arrest in 1981. And uh, another uh, chief who said we need to follow up when we did randomly assign arrest many years ago. Um, what had happened in Minneapolis was that the state legislature created the power to arrest people when the police hadn't seen the uh, offense under the common law they couldn't do that uh, when they were given the power they said they didn't want to use it because they thought it would cause more harm uh, against the victims but 35 of them volunteered to uh, exercise uh, a random assignment protocol um, and this was the result 10 percent re-arrest when uh, an arrest was made by random assignment versus uh, up to 24 percent where they sent the suspect out of the house for the night or 19% where they just tried to uh, do some sort of uh, informal counseling on the spot. And, and in both those two higher bar graphs, they had left the couple together in the home. Well, this made headlines around the world. Um, it was very good news that something could be done and that it would work. Uh, except uh, the authors, Sherman and Burke, said, we need to replicate this uh, because there could be unusual things about Minneapolis, which indeed there turned out to be after uh, there were five more replications, uh, the complication turned out to be that Minneapolis had a very low unemployment rate, about 3%. And when you go to places like Milwaukee with uh, high concentrations of unemployment in African-American neighborhoods, what you got was a strong moderator effect of employment. So that for unemployed offenders, arrest was uh, backfiring, as this graph from Miami, which is predominantly Hispanic population, uh, and indeed, by law, they had to be married, uh, shows that you doubled the rate of reoffending when you arrested unemployed men, and you cut it in half when you arrested employed men. That was true for a Hispanic population. Uh, we first discovered it with a predominantly African American population in the upper left hand uh, table, um, a, a graphic uh, you're seeing uh, the Milwaukee uh, interaction effect, and then predominantly white working class in Omaha had the same uh, interaction effect. Uh, even the overall uh, um, pool data analysis uh, that uh, NIJ published has shown this unemployment uh, interaction. And that sort of just got ignored. Um, uh, that was the bad news that got ignored. This was the good news that got ignored. This is the percentage of victims surviving without a repeat injury uh, for up to a year after the police randomly assigned going to get a warrant on their own authority for offenders who had already left the premises by the time the police got there, which is about half the cases. And offender absent cases when the police arrive are still an area, I think, that could be explored. This has never been replicated, but the uh, survival of the women who uh, didn't have the police get a warrant for the arrest of their assailant uh, is down at around 45% uh, by the end of that line compared to 70% if the police had gotten the warrant. So a big effect, very interesting effect, and uh, I think still needs to be followed up uh, as an example of many sort of Damocles nudges, and in fact it was the primary basis for the turning point experiment in West Midlands, which is now being used with first offenders for everything except domestic violence, which everybody agreed cannot be experimented with because for some reason you can't study the problem of domestic violence. You just have to do the right thing. Well, is it the right thing? And what did we learn from following up the Milwaukee experiment for 23 years? 
What we learn is uh, the Times put it mildly in this case. It not, it's not a question of may harm, it's a question of may kill, as the risk ratio shows, with death from all causes. If you arrested the abuser of a Milwaukee victim in 1987-88, uh, as the Milwaukee police did with 99% compliance with random assignment, you increase the chances of the woman dying by 64% compared to if the police gave them a warning. And again, these are high volume, low harm, 90% with no injuries, certainly no serious injuries of any kind, um, but with always having some physical contact. We were comparing removal from the home with handcuffs, uh, visible to the neighbors, jail for two to 72 hours, and 95% with no prosecution. Um, compared to reading a scripted test uh, that somebody is going to go to jail if we have to come back here for the night. And this was all done by screening for eligibility first, then calling the office and having an envelope opened uh, that was based on a random uh, numbers sequence. And so if you look at the time to death for the victims whose offenders were arrested versus uh, warned, you see that there was, from a very early stage in the follow-up, up to 23 years when we cut it off, uh, a growing difference in the death rate from all causes. Uh, some medical researchers have dismissed this as possibly an imbalance due to smoking, um, but we're talking about 1,100 cases, and it's hard to get imbalance on those baseline uh, factors. Um, certainly, uh, the moderator effect of race is an important part of this story. Uh, because there was a 100% increase in the death rate for black victims if their partners were arrested, and almost no increase for white victims. So this is uh, an effect that we have identified in one of the most segregated cities in the United States. It may not generalize beyond Milwaukee. Um, I think uh, it's very uh, hard to say this would apply uh, in UK settings where there's very few um, uh, concentrated poverty areas that are also highly segregated to the extent that Milwaukee is. Nonetheless, uh, it's striking that the biggest increase in death was among African American women who held jobs in a neighborhood that was predominantly uh, headed by um, female heads of household on welfare. So these would be what Elijah Anderson calls decent women who uh, wanted to identify with mainstream values uh, and whose shame, perhaps, uh, speculating here, uh, but whatever the reason might be, it, there is certainly something much more lethal about having your partner or husband arrested uh, if you are a working woman in those settings. So um, heart disease is one of the many causes of death that was different. You can read the paper uh, uh, free online through the Springer uh, link. You can also see the Campbell Collaboration Review of Second Responder Programs, a good idea. Uh, somebody follows up to give services, possibly even warn the perpetrators, not on the night when the police are called, but within a week uh, afterwards. Uh, a wonderful um, forest graph that shows that this program favors the treatment, but the measure of favoring is that calls to the police went up, while victim self-reports said there was no difference. So whether it's a good thing that calls to police go up, or whether it actually means there's more domestic violence, I think remains um, up in the air, certainly not a good basis for policy. What is a good basis for policy is the experiment in Hampshire, the CARA project, for first-time male offenders, uh, where they have two sessions, uh, they're randomly assigned to a conditional caution with two sessions in a hotel, where they talk about what they're doing. It's kind of cognitive behavior, but it's much more uh, intensive and emotionally demanding that certainly then the comparison group, which is essentially a simple caution of be good for four months and then we, we won't prosecute you. The differences in offenses uh, per thousand offenders uh, are very strong, uh, over half uh, uh, in, the, um, in the control group that we get in the workshop. If you look at the Cambridge Crime Harm Index, which multiplies the offense type by the number of prison days that we get under the sentencing guidelines, there's an 86% uh, reduction. Uh, in the treatment group. So that's great news. Um, borderline significance, so the trial is still going on and it's still trying desperately to get cases uh, because even though there's 25 to 40 
cases in that part of Southampton each week, uh, an average of 1.86 cases are eligible because of a huge increase in the proportion of cases that are assessed at highest risk. And this risk assessment process uh, has clearly uh, changed over time and the case flow has gone down as the risk assessments have gone up. The question then is what is the evidence for predicting uh, serious harm from the DASH risk assessment tool which is uh, explicitly stated not to be used for prediction purposes. But what's happening is that people who could get access to this program can because the constable in the first uh, uh, investigation has uh, turned in a high risk assessment under DASH. So there's many more bricks in the wall we need to build about evidence for policing. Um, the problem is that to do that we often run up against a brick wall because we can't do random assignment of some of the most fundamental uh, questions. I think the question still remains, um, given the enormous cost of the uh, police work that's done on these cases, and given the Suffolk finding published by Matthew Bland this year, that three out of four calls to the police in Suffolk for domestic disturbance uh, have no repetition, uh, that the level of seriousness averages 15 days uh, in jail on the first uh, call out, it drops to 10 on the second, it goes back up to 12 on the third, and there is no escalation over 36,000 calls uh, for six years in Suffolk. There may be some after the fourth call out, and that would vastly reduce the, the number of cases in which the police would do anything, including taking somebody down to be held while the decision is made not to prosecute in most cases. But I, I think, since we're here discussing what we've learned from RCTs and how we can save money, this evidence really shouldn't be ignored. Thank you very much. Our second speaker today is the commander of Solihull Local Policing Unit and the lead for West Midlands Police on preventing violent extremism. Chief Superintendent Alex Murray is the founder of the Society for Evidence-Based Policing and has been integral to the increasing adoption of evidence-based policing by forces across the country. In 2014, he, was, um, he received the Superintendent's Award for Excellence in Policing and was recognized by George Mason's University Center for Evidence-Based Policing. Please welcome to the stage, Alex Murray. Thank you. Stephen Pinker in the front chair there. Do not speak in the passive tense. Do not speak in the passive tense. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go home and tell my daughter that I have shared a stage with F1. Uh, I won't be telling her which F1, she'll be suitably impressed. <laughs> but you are a handsome chap anyway. Um, any of you get those mailings from water companies that say you really need insurance in case your pipes outside burst because they're really expensive? Uh, got some nods of the head. Has anyone actually got that insurance? No one. Well, I used to have it, and I tried claiming on it once, and of course there's a thousand technicalities around why those water companies will never pay. And this is a letter I got last week from my water company telling me why I should pay that insurance, even though I know it's rubbish. Look at how they have adopted behavioural science in their mailing to me. Last year, HomeSafe responded to 352 plumbing problems in your B92 area. And if that's not enough, there's a great big blue mark for everyone that uh, has used this insurance, even though I know it's rubbish. Now, what makes me angry about this is that if commercial companies who I think uh, offer a questionable service can adopt behavioural insights in how they do stuff, how much more important is it for people like policing, whose job it is to prevent harm and to make a difference, should also do the same? Uh, and yet we seem not to be able to. Uh, and I am forever grateful to Simon and the Behavioural Insights team for working with the West Midlands uh, Police and the Doors Trust who have assisted us with the funding. Uh, and I'm forever grateful to Professor Sherman for teaching me nearly everything I know about evidence-based policing, as you'll see in a bit. Um, so, we have adopted a number of trials in the West Midlands, and I'm just going to briefly talk about some of those. Now, looking at this good audience here, I can see many of you will be familiar with this setting. This is cell walls. Um, and I find it quite interesting that 
Uh, if I was a commercial organisation and my job was to stop people reoffending, reduce crime and prevent victims of crime and I had someone for 24 hours uh, that I think I might be a little more imaginative when I put them in a cell around the messages I might send. So, I mean, for goodness sake, we're even using stencils. I thought stencils died out in the 1980s, but that's what you see. So one of the experiments we're working on is what messaging can we put in cells, whether it's on a cell wall, or whether it's with a leaflet that we give out that could have a deterrent effect. You may have seen, alluded to a number of times, the fascinating results that the Behavioural Insight team has found out in Avon and Somerset with BME recruitment, the recruitment of black and minority ethnic officers uh, into Avon and Somerset Police. Big difference uh, with a situational judgment test that computer that was on the computer that was eliminated by a very simple email edition that said, think about your values and your community's values before you take this assessment. This is something we are replicating in West Mids. The trial is finished and we're just analysing the data, but not with situational judgment tests, with the one-on-one -on -one interviews that follow. We're also then looking at prompting honesty. So you have a smartphone, an iPhone, it's very expensive, six, seven hundred pounds, you lose it, your insurance company saying we need a crime number, what are you going to do? It's going to cost you £600, way off. Now if I phone up the police and lie about it, I'm going to save £600. And of course it completely distorts our crime figures and our investigators waste a load of time investigating a theft that was never a theft, it was a loss. So what can our call takers do to prompt honesty? And again we're working with Dan around some messaging where we give people the opportunity to phone back and therefore not having to face the fact that they are lying by, uh, we, by us asking them Firstly, thanks very much for being really honest. Secondly, we need your IMEI number, so you go find your IMEI number and phone us back. And we'll see on an RCT basis whether that has an impact. We're looking at speeding fines. Uh, some of you may have had speeding fines. Uh, the letter you receive, certainly uh, the letters I may have received in the past, um, are full of gobbledygook. Uh, professional narcissism, I, refer, I heard it referred to as yesterday, really good. But you try and understand what that letter is saying, it's not clear, and as a result, there's loads of, um, uh, loads of lost letters, people don't respond on time and it wastes the system, so we're looking at that. Uh, we're also looking at victim and witness attrition rates when they come to court, and we're looking at one or two other trials as well. So, um, it's a really exciting time to be working with the Behavioural Insight team, but in West Mids we have conducted a number of trials that make the ability to work with the Behavioural Insight team uh, a little more easy, and I'm just going to go through some of those now, and many of them are with uh, collaboration with Cambridge University. So, body warm video. This one is Barak Ariel, an academic from Cambridge, and Darren Henstock. This was a, a really good RCT on shifts, where shifts were randomly allocated body worn videos, uh, and we then looked at a number of variables as potential outcome rates, uh, and they were quite profound. So here we see cumulative use of force for those people who were wearing body-worn video cameras and those who were not. The blue line is when the camera is on, the red line is when the camera is off. That's an over a 50% difference in use of force. You can see along the x-axis, compliant handcuffs, physical restraint, non-compliant handcuffs, baton, CS, taser, taser used, and dogs. <laughs> if we then look at injuries to offenders, you can see that there is a massive difference in the injury to offenders when the camera is off compared to when the camera is on, 46 to 16. There's also a 12% increase in charges for when the camera is on, and there are also no complaints when the camera were on compared to 10 in the control group when cameras were off. And we've got some statistical significance there. Number of theories as to why that might be, one might be that police officers moderate their behaviour when they're wearing a camera. The other one might be that members of the public moderate their behaviour. We don't know, but either way, these results were very happy. One other fascinating insight, though, that we need to spend some time thinking about is officer injury. Because officer injuries have gone up, although this is not statistically significant, when the cameras are on and not when they're off. Now, why could that be? Well, we can hypothesise why that might be. It might be because officers are confident or they're less confident in acting quickly to restrain somebody and therefore they're assaulted. We don't know. But again, that's not statistically significant. Professor Sherman spoke earlier uh, about a trial that was conducted in uh, West Midlands which we call Turning Point. So how do we create turning points in people's lives? Now, this was based in some really inconvenient evidence for the police 
largely by an academic called Petrosino that showed that for certain cohorts of offenders, particularly young people, <coughs> entry into the criminal justice system had a criminogenic effect, i.e. it created more crime, and the problem is, if my opinion principle is to prevent crime, all my effort is spent pushing people through the criminal justice system. That's the dichotomy we face. So a trial has been designed with Peter Nehru, Professor Sherman, uh, Jamie Hobday was the lead in West Midlands Police, where we said, okay, for people who are going to be charged, so forget the caution, you were being charged for the first time, they were randomly then offered um, an opportunity to have a turning point. So speak to an offender manager and your charge will be held over you for six months, like the sword of Damocles. Obey the contract that the offender manager agrees with you, it might be employment, it might be drug treatment, uh, and we then test what happens with their reoffending rate. With the prevalence of arrest, with the frequency of arrest, and with the crime arm index. And what we found so far, and this is something I believe that we will look at every year, probably for the next 23 years as, as pathways diverge, is that there is no net difference at this point in reoffending between the two. Now that's got significant cost implications because going through the court is much more expensive than every criminal justice service. More than that, though, if you look at violent crime, we are seeing a significant reduction in reoffending for those people who avoided the criminal justice system, uh, over 30%. And again, early days, uh, and we are just off statistical significance with this one or two more cases, uh, and it will be hit. But significant as far as prevalence, frequency, and using the crime harm index. We also had a profound effect on witnesses by taking a different approach to how we update witnesses. Here's one for people who say you can't do randomised controlled trials with serious crime and with counter-terrorism. This one was done by, again, Barak Ariel and Brandon Langley, superintendent from West Midlands Police at Birmingham Airport. Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act, you can stop anybody crossing the border uh, you wish without suspicion to investigate whether they are involved in the commission, preparation or instigation of terrorist acts. Now these are people largely from minority communities, as you can imagine, and they are people whose legitimacy and their perception of legitimacy in the police is really important. So we would want to foster legitimacy. So what is it we can say or do uh, when we conduct these Schedule 7 checks to build a sense of legitimacy? And Brandon and Barak experimented with two different hypotheses. One was Daniel Kahneman's experience utility theory, if you've read Thinking Fast and Slow. This is that people remember the last encounter and what utility they had out of it. What did I get out of it? Did I win anything? versus the procedural fairness idea that we were persuaded that what the officer was doing was absolutely fair. This is Tom Tyler and Lorraine Maserol have demonstrated again and again that procedural fairness is really interesting. And what they found in actual fact was a small but statistically significant benefit for the experience utility theory. So what people had as they were disembarking off an aeroplane was a, a, a token that gave them a free trolley, normally they pay one or two pounds, and a fast track uh, through immigration. Uh, and they, that seemed to have an effect on a sense of cooperation. Uh, this one hopefully will be replicated again and again. I've got colleagues here from University College London. Uh, we have a relationship with them. Shane Johnson came up with this about 10 years ago. Um, really interesting uh, picture that shows if you have been a victim of burglary, unfortunately you're more likely to be a victim of burglary again and very soon, but more than that, your neighbours are at increased risk and your neighbours' neighbours are at increased risk and that becomes null at about 400 yards either side of the victim's location. So the concept of near repeat risk. And what you see from the dark blue line at the top, that was within the first week, the risk level, compared to the purple line at the bottom, that's two weeks. So you have to act as a police officer really quickly if you're going to do something about negating that risk of near repeats. So this was a, an experiment around lodging and um, we use stickers like this, as well as some other target hardening equipment. Um, and on a random basis, we allocated houses that were subject to, A, the risk of being repeat victim, but also the houses either side, so nine houses in totality. And what we found, this is an old graph here on the left, I've got another one that's 720 days after, is that we found that the, there was a st statistically significant effect on survivability in the low crime areas, but not the high crime areas. So you can actually increase the protection of those nine houses in the low crime areas. The trend was the same in the high crime areas, but it just wasn't statistically significant. <coughs> we also did an experiment within an experiment, and it went horribly wrong, so I just thought I'd use this as an example as a, uh, as a bit of honesty. So 
Part of it was also, did you have an increase in satisfaction as a member of the public and as a victim of crime or your neighbours being a victim of crime? And let's compare the two to see what the cost benefit was there. And so I used this wonderful um, piece of insight from the Forward Error and Debt publication from the Behavioural Insights team. And we sent surveys out to people, uh, victims of crime and their near neighbours, to say, can you respond? But on some of the surveys, we put a little yellow post-it note that said, by the way, people who know that it makes a big impact on the community tend to respond much more uh, to surveys. Thank you very much. But uh, we subcontracted this bit, uh, and when we got all the surveys back, we weren't able to attribute which survey had had the yellow post-it and which wasn't. So there you go, it's just a, a confessor. Okay. Uh, everyone here aware of PCSOs, Police Community Support Officers? Okay. Some yes, some no. These are uh, non-warranted officers who don't have the powers of a constable. Uh, they wear hats like that, often in blue, uh, and they are cheaper than police officers. Um, and most people believe that their role is around engagement and confidence building. Uh, and what Joe Smallwood, again with Barrack Ariel from Cambridge, uh, Superintendent of West Midlands Police, was they did a great uh, randomised control trial using hotspot pentagons like this. So a PCSO would walk around these micro hotspots three times a day from Monday through to Thursday. And we had about 150 of these pentagons, I believe, and they were randomly allocated into that patrol or not. So the control group was police officers, PCSOs, patrollers, UC fit. This one, they were geo-fenced, so we knew when they were in there, we knew when they were out, and they were very compliant. Uh, and this was testing the routine activity theory that suggests that for a crime to take place, you need a victim, a willing offender, and the absence of a capable guardian. Next video demonstrates what a capable guardian of me is. Standing in the basement of the... This was me uh, yesterday. The that was me on the phone, not actually knowing uh, I was having my audio recorded. Um, we were trying to see the reaction of people to me. Eye contact, really interesting. Nobody gave me eye contact from thousands of people past me. Look at that dodgy fellow. <laughs> What was in his pocket? He's a police officer as well. Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's having a good look, aren't they? Hi there. Everything's fine. So this is the manager. A bit concerned. No, uh, this is all part of the event. And now she's going to say So what we see is the uh, presence of a capable guardian cause, causes people to behave in a slightly different way, even with you good people uh, in the audience, certainly none of you being criminals. And this is what they found in this trial. Overall, a net difference of 10% reduction in crime using PCSO. So it wasn't about engagement. Their presence reduced crime by 10%. And if you look at those high crime hotspots and, and segregate them into high high crime, medium high crime and low high crime, we find this differential. So in the high high crime areas it went down 53%, medium down 30% and in the low it went up 157%. Uh, we attribute that to having an officer there, shopkeeper might well say, oh, I'll just have a shop, someone's just been shoplifting so can you, can you take it as a crime? But the interesting point was a 10% net reduction. So, I just want to end with Society of Evidence-Based Policing. Uh, please go on the website. Uh, our aim is to communicate, use uh, and uh, produce good research evidence that is applied. We have now one in Australia and New Zealand, one's just launched in the US, one in Canada, uh, and it's free to join and again massively supported uh, by uh, Professor Sherman, who's one of our honorary presidents. Uh, and it offers all sorts of discounts and also a network into a community of people who want to be evidence-based. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to questions in a second, but I just thought I might take the chair's privilege to ask um, one question which I think is particularly relevant. Um, so it's fantastic to see more and more RCTs um, across the country in policing, and it's great to see the College of Policing and the What Work Centre taking a more active role, but do we have yet the institutional setup and support required to encourage more RCTs and to systematise this approach across the country? 
Well, I, I think there's two issues, one of which Alex should address, which is the culture of the chief police officers uh, who have lots of reasons uh, not to be taking uh, risks uh, that can be challenged by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. Um, you know, the idea of a control group is very appealing here, but to these oversight bodies, it can look like negligence of duty, failure to, to uh, meet standards uh, of care. And so that's really, uh, my answer on the outside of this uh, is that we need to formally create safe space in which innovations can be carefully tested, we can get cost-benefit analysis, and the police agencies that are willing to take those risks uh, are protected in advance from being criticized by the oversight agencies for having undertaken an experiment. This might require more advanced review, uh, but on the other hand, if you had an advanced review, you might not do something so transparent to burglars as not sending uh, an investigator to an even-numbered uh, street address, as opposed to random assignment, which would not be so transparent to burglars. And that would have been an easy way to fix what became uh, a problem. Um, but in general, I think we need to have um, uh, a societal commitment to learning what works in policing as assuming that if case by case we're just all smarter, we can make things better. I think we have to understand organizational learning and societal learning. That's what these randomized trials need, but they can't happen to the extent that they should if the chief constable's got to worry about having a report come out criticizing them. And that leads to problems on the inside that maybe Alex wants to talk about. And again, like Dan Connellan, he might not want to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Yeah, uh, a couple of points. No one really gets in trouble for doing what you've always done. It's a safe, safe bet to do that. Uh, and so you need to think about that. Uh, the second point I'd make is that uh, what's the research question? What's the best methods that answers that research question? RCTs do a lot of that. Uh, 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 an evidence base doesn't necessarily mean you always have to use RCTs, and RCTs are somewhat difficult. Uh, that turning point one was incredibly difficult, but we managed it. Um, and then the final thing I want to say is, uh, I love this quote really, three things why ideas fail in policing, and I think this will resonate with a lot of people. First one is, yeah, we do that already. So if you come up with an idea, everybody will say, yeah, we do that. Uh, second one is, uh, yeah, we did that and it didn't work. The third one is, it's different here. Uh, and we are all incredibly proud of our police services uh, and we will always, when someone comes up with a bright new idea, whether it's a method or a tactic, apply one of those three answers as a reason why we won't do it. Thank you. I think those uh, um, reasons aren't particular to um, police forces either. Um, okay, can I have some questions, please? Uh, first of all, Lady in Pink. Sorry, I'm just asking uh, the um, Chief Superintendent, what about um, police were able to get ahead if they've got a lot of arrests, so that's seen as a good worker, so then they would get to detective training school and, and be seen as uh, really good. Does that mean, does that have any cultural implications or, or is that not what's valued anymore because they might want to get a lot of arrests instead of um, trying the new approach? Has there been any... Yeah, so you, you make quite a good observation around organisational culture and it will vary within a force as well as across forces. I, I do though think that generally that is something that has passed. So the idea of key, perform key performance indicators, and I remember as a constable having a tick list, if you got an arrest for a KPI, it was much better, you know, theft of motor vehicle, good, uh, public order, bad. Um, that's, uh, that I think has largely disappeared. Uh, but I'm speaking from my experience in West Midlands Police. Uh, other cultures, some healthy, some unhealthy, will replace that. Should we take three three questions together? <coughs> First, second, third, please. Surely one of, one of the biggest uh, empirical phenomena in uh, criminology is the massive crime decline of uh, the last uh, 25 years, particularly in the United States, but also to some extent in, in, uh, in Wales. And as you know, there are no shortage of theories uh, of gasoline, abortion, cell phone camera, CCTV, uh, community policing, etc., etc. So I'd be curious as to each of you, what is what theory uh, would you uh, support uh, given the evidence that we have so far? 
Thank you. On over here. Thank you. I've got a question for Alex. I was interested in the um, victims and uh, witnesses participation trial that you mentioned briefly. Could you say a little bit more about what you're actually trying out there? I understand it's, it's still in progress, but uh, we're doing a project at the moment with um, MOPAC around victims. I'm really interested to kind of uh, just get some more information about that. Thank you. Thank you. There was a third one. Please. Uh, I'm interested in uh, cost agency action. Basically, I understand the text. For example, one of the buying people up and spend the time actually uh, getting taken away from a life of crime. Uh, partly by bringing in uh, medical. Sorry, partly by bringing in Baptist staff. Okay, uh, cross agency uh, approach to uh, crime prevention. Basically, the evidence appears to be that those involved in commission of crime and families also consider the loss of health service resources, especially mental health service resources. Understanding in Texas there's been an approach which is basically stop investing in banging criminals up and actually invest more and actually try to make sure that they, they, they fundamentally change. Is that the future? Okay. Should we start with um, Stephen Pinker's question? Okay. Uh, I've got a really simple answer on this one. I think if crime is going down, it's because of exceptional police leadership. <laughs> If crime is going up, it's because of all sorts of other socio-economic indicators. <laughs> um, but being a, a, a closet and hobbyist criminologist, I think it's probably an amalgam of all the seven you mentioned, including the one you didn't mention that you push very much in your book, um, A Better Angels of Our Nature, The History of Violence, which I recommend to everybody, really interesting, which is the civilization, the civilizing hypothesis, that empathy is growing and growing and growing, and as empathy grows, crime becomes more unacceptable, particularly violent crime. Uh, and as we see more and more domestic violence reporting, for example, that might be an example of that, but my view would be an amalgam. The professional criminologist might be. Um, I, I think it is important to note the major exception to the trends that uh, uh, Professor Pinker mentioned is Latin America, where especially in pretty developed economies like those at the south cone of the continent, uh, Uruguay I know best, where there's been huge reductions in income inequality, huge reductions in unemployment, massive increases in female participation in the workforce, all sorts of wonderful things, and the homicide rate has doubled, the robbery rates up, lots of guns, uh, lots of uh, vehicles to take you to crimes, perhaps part of the story in terms of the changing routine activities. But um, there's still something much more fundamental about why Latin America doesn't fit the thousand year trend. Uh, that has been so well documented in, in Europe. And um, if we go back to the Europe and North Atlantic, uh, I think um, uh, I would add uh, specifically hotspots policing, once the hotspots were identified by the IT revolution, um, most dramatically in New York City when uh, Bill Clinton wanted to give 5,000 cops to New York and um, uh, Mayor Giuliani said, I just got 5,000 cops, I need 5,000 computers. Well, not quite exactly that many, but they did get computers instead of cops. And instead of having an 11-month lag to get the crime statistics, they got it within five days. And they started mapping the hotspots. And everything that happened in New York after that was in the context of far more precise information about where and when the risks of crime were greatest. And that was not just New York. It was sweeping the country because of laptops and everything else that was going on. So I don't think we can ignore that, but at the same time, we have to understand the sociological context of the aging population, in which a much higher proportion of the population is over 65 than at any other time in human history. And I, as a person over 65, want to take a lot of credit for setting a good example and showing all of you how to behave. Thank Thanks very much. Um, just because I'm conscious of time, I wonder if it would be okay if we talked about the um, victim and witnesses attrition case uh, maybe afterwards, and in one minute, if possible, uh, you could uh, comment on the cross-agency question. Um, I'd rather just very quickly say that the victims were told that their client, their offender wasn't being prosecuted because they were going to be put in this very fast rehabilitation program that was going to begin the day after they got arrested, and if they were sent to court, it would take months. And the victims found that so compelling that their satisfaction with what the police were doing with their case went over 75% compared to 50% when they were told that the offender was going to be prosecuted. That's really the most important finding at a turning point that uh, Alex would mention. And I'm not sure I understood the other question, so I prefer to give the answer to the question I liked. Like, I, I, I learned that yesterday from somebody else over 65. <laughs> <laughs> to clarify, it's basically uh, a 
I find by the police officer talks of himself being a psychiatric nurse, mainly rather than a copper. Uh, there is a, an enormous benefit in looking across agency at uh, how families especially consume health resources and try protection in the police. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, so what, what, what can I say? Uh, you know, when we need that holistic approach uh, and for too long we've been stuck in our CJ silos uh, and I guess that's a bit what Troubled Families is trying to do in the UK um, but what are the causes of crime, what are the causes of people not committing crime very few of the causes on both those fronts are not in the criminal justice system they are in housing, they're in poverty, they're in health, they're in education etc. Thanks very much, I'm afraid we have to... Well, just in terms of the capacity to deal with mental health problems, and a huge portion of all police business is mental health. I, I think we do have to look, recognize the limitations of what the police can do, and that uh, it cannot be a substitute for uh, a very effective mental health system, probably even a bigger problem in the United States uh, than here. But uh, the, the limitations of, of partnerships come in when you're asking the police to do the job that a trained psychiatrist would need to do, and they can't. Thank you both. Okay, as we switch our attention now to um, broader challenges which uh, go further than solely the police service, let me introduce our third speaker. So, um, Angela is well placed to explore one of the fastest growing crime types and some of the human behaviours that might allow that to happen. Um, professor Angela Sass is the Professor of Human Centred Technology and Head of Information Security Research at the Department of Com Computer Science at UCL. For the past 15 years, her team has conducted pioneering research into how humans understand security privacy, identity, and trust online. She has published 200 peer-reviewed papers and is currently the director of UK Research Institute in Science and Cybersecurity. Please, everybody, would you welcome Angela Sass. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as Simon Candy mentioned, I've been looking at online security behaviour for a very long time now. Um, so, the first study we conducted was in 1996, and it ended up being published in a paper called Users Are Not the Enemy. What we did there is we were called in because um, the company uh, had a problem with the cost of running help desks for resetting passwords for their own employees. So just to give you an idea, that they basically had for three years running, the number of people they needed to employ on those help desks had trebled every year. And the accountants said, this can't go on, look at this, fix it. Right? And so I got a, um, so the company was at that time employing 100 people in a call centre up in Scotland who were doing nothing all day long but reset passwords for the company's employees. And then they had separate call centres for dealing with the various services the company was providing to their customers. So clearly, I mean, this was a non-trivial cost. So what we found out when we did the study was, um, the, by the way, the brief I got for the study is like, you know, you're, you have a usability background. Can you do a quick study and tell us why these stupid users can't remember their passwords? <laughs> Hand up, anybody here who doesn't have a problem with managing passwords? I thought, one person at that, <laughs> using LastPass or something, yeah. Okay. Um, but, but basically, so in a way, basically it's quite shocking if you think about it as well, the problem actually really still persists um, to, today. So when, when we wrote the, um, the, the answer was pretty similar, it was pretty simple to this question, these people aren't stupid, you're asking them to do something that's humanly impossible, right? If basically people have between 16 and 64 different passwords, like our participants did, um, you're changing, the, um, there were six digit pins or eight character passwords, they had to be random, they had to be different for every system, and they were changed on a monthly basis. You know, you just have to say that, I'm sorry, human memory doesn't work that way, right? And you ask them to do something that's humanly impossible. So, um, we also found that a lot of users weren't aware of the risks that were associated with some of their behaviours and so we, we said like, well, maybe there should be a bit more awareness and training. So there's something that, that should change on the user side as well as changing um, the whole system around password, which is gratifying enough actually something the company did 
not quite to the extent that we wanted, but at least there are some changes introducing single sign-ons, um, basically pulling back from six-digit pins to four-digit ones, um, extending the expiry date um, to three months um, or six months rather than uh, on a monthly basis and so on. But really the, the problems actually still persist and actually one of the things I hadn't thought about at the time when I recommended security awareness and education was I hadn't really thought about what purpose would it serve. You know, I thought if we make users more aware of what the risks are and you know that, you, that if, if people are saying, well, who would know what my dog is called, you know, or would know what my, you know, what my girlfriend's favorite food is, you go like, well, that's not the point, <laughs> you know, that's not what an attacker does. They don't tackle you. They don't attack you personally, they're using widely available resources um, to guess what's the most likely answer. And, um, and so, you know, they're not targeting you personally, they want just any account within the company will help. So, so I hadn't really thought of, what I hadn't really thought about is like what value would that, that really be to, to educate people about, uh, about this, those things. And, it's really, that value hasn't really been questioned in the whole security community at all. So if you basically speak to security experts, and you speak to people in companies who are responsible for corporate security, they will say like, yes, we have security awareness and education programs and everybody has to do them. Um, and and it's, it's, if you speak to security people, you know, very often the kind of phrases you will hear is, people are the weakest link, Right? If only people would, would change their behavior, we wouldn't have such a problem with, with cyber attacks. Um, and you know, we, people just need to be made more aware. And finally, last year, the, uh, the Information Security Forum, which is a research, research association composed of 100 global companies, conducted, they conducted um, an, a survey of all their members and they asked and they then came to the conclusion Yes, it's very widely done, but it's not working, right? Basically the same, we're throwing the same stuff at people every year and it's just background noise. Um, and what's quite funny is <laughs> on the one hand they recommend it, and on the other hand if you, if you look at the list at the back what they say companies could do and should do, they effectively consist of, of the same kind of things that they're already doing. Right? So you can then get some, some more um, <coughs> behaviors, so, so, some more sort of aggressive um, approaches more recently, such as companies phishing their own employees. And then say like, oh, you fell for this phishing, you know, clearly you need to read the entire education again <laughs> of how to do that. So, and I actually think, it's so, so the mind shift that actually needs to happen in the, in the security community hasn't happened. So they still keep bashing the individual as the weakest link and the cause of the problem. But the reality is that actually who we really need to target is those security professionals because the behaviors that are required can't be done most of the time. So we basically look very regularly at corporate security policies and various mechanisms. We've, we've conducted um, close to a thousand interviews with employees and organizations and what they will tell you is why they're not complying, and that is, if I complied with the security policy, I couldn't get my job done. And if I didn't get my job done, you know, I'd be fired. You know, nobody would accept the excuse that it's because of the security policy. So people actually have a built-in, and if we look at the whole behavioral economics literature, none of this will, will come as any news is. People actually have a, a built-in meter when they feel that too much of their non-productive time is being siphoned off, for unproductive tasks, they think this is too much, you know, and now they're basically looking for ways of avoiding it so they can get their main job done. Um, and what we've actually found is most organizations is if you look at the reaction to when they detect non-compliance, the organization is actually tacitly complicit, i.e. when a push comes to a shaft, then they say like, yeah, of course, you know, we can't lose this customer just this time, you know, it's okay to share your password or to download the documents and take them home um, or whatever. And this is really going on on an epic scale. You know, I'm quite con I can quite confidently say that in most organizations out there, most employees break most of the security policies they're subject to most of the time. Right? That's where we're at. So this is so compliance special, and I would really like, like to, to appeal for more of, of you behavioral experts to really come into this area. 
I've been screaming and banging my head about, <laughs> about this against the wall for 15 years, um, and the security experts aren't listening, and the leadership of organizations isn't listening. You know, I need help to actually help me. So if, with some individual organizations, I've been able to quantify the productivity losses that unworkable security policies create. So you're damaging productivity and you're not getting security. Why are you doing this? Why? I mean, in any other area, this, this would be challenged and questioned and thrown out. Um, so we, we have been, been applying, for instance, Richard Thaler's work on mental accounting to basically show just exactly when people fall off because they basically quite rightly and rationally decide the effort is too much. But nobody, none of the security experts, when I go into an organization, I always say to the CISO, it's Chief Information Security Officer, what's your biggest group of employees? They go, 500 people over here doing X. And I say, okay, so here are your security policies, all 500, and, you know, it's usually around 400 in the big corporation, 400 and something of them. Which of those policies do these people have co to comply with? And how much time do they have to spend per day, per week, doing that? I've never found one, in all my 15 years of doing this, one security uh, officer who could give me an answer to it. They don't fit. They write the policies, chuck them out there, and they actually don't really follow up whether this is indoor. It's quite, you know, it's really quite, quite shocking when you think about it. So we really need to look at this. So this is, but the, 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 the behavior changing that I want to count to us now is, this has left us in a really, really bad situation. So if most people break most of the policies most of the time, what do we have is we've got a super widespread habit of insecure behavior, right? And it's gone to the people aren't even aware they're doing it. Um, I'm sparing, um, I could have shown a, 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 a cut from Coppers, the Channel 4 TV series, right, where um, the, you have on the custody sergeant, basically in the custody suite, checking in people, and behind him is a whiteboard where it says, um, the password is custody, underlined three times. <laughs> I have dozens of these, I've got hundreds of photographs of, of oblivious password disclosure. Right? People need to, need to share and remind themselves so habitually they don't notice that they're, they're doing it. You know? So here's from the last year's uh, flood, um, you know, winter 14, storm password. Yeah. And while we're at it, why don't we throw the authentication key for the, for the thing in, right? Um, you know, the Royal Highness, um, the military logon details, of this, uh, behind you. Um, this guy is the, the head of a company that's just been hacked on a major scale, giving a TV interview with the passwords for the company's Twitter, <laughs> Facebook account, and everything behind them, right? Um, and even this happens to security companies, so, so this is an Italian company that sells spying software, they got hacked, and it basically says a, a, a developer used the very common passwords you know, to access his main, main service, and so it was a doddle for the attackers to hack the accounts. So we might laugh at this, you know, and it's easy to say stupid people, but if you basically follow, it, follow what I've been telling you about what's actually happening, this is the logical consequence of leaving, of basically just um, demanding unworkable things. And so I was really, really gratified when Richard Taylor said yesterday, is, you know, if you don't make it easy for people to do the right things, you know, don't stop, you know, you might as well try and bother, you know, to, to increase awareness, to educate, to nudge people into various behaviors. You can't do that for behaviors that aren't actually doable. So, um, the, this, this really key thing is that security is too much work is something um, that, we, that we need to, to change. And I would also <coughs> add that as another point, this ubiquity of bad or outdated advice that's often being pushed, it really poisons the well. My colleague Cormac Hurley from Microsoft basically says it's, you know, the, the fact that, that consumers, it's not just employees, but consumers out there who are doing online interactions on social networks, retail sites and so on, they don't follow the advice they're being given. If there's a warning popping up saying, you know, the certificates ex ex expires, <laughs> it's basically over 90% of those warnings are false positives. It's totally rational for people to ignore, you know, to, to learn to ignore those, those warnings. But then, of course, that generalizes and they ignore all warnings. So we really need, once we've cleaned up our act, we're going to need a massive, uh, massive behavior change. I'm afraid, you know, when the UK government has done lots of good things in this area, 
But when I asked the Cyber Streetwise people is you've got a very nice, well-designed campaign, you know, why are you giving advice that is outdated and bound? You know, so the key thing is not to have a, is, is not necessarily to have a strong password, is the most important advice is not to reuse that password across sites that, that have potential risks because the attackers all get together and swap details and they're actually targeting ordinary people like you and me by accum by accumulating various information about it. So if your, if your password's broken once. They're not saying, you know, ask your, your service provider how they're protecting the password file, right? Because every time when there's a massive leak, they're going like, oh, look at all these people who have weak passwords. But why was that password there, password file, in plain text <laughs> to be downloaded in a really simple, straightforward attack? If I had the strongest password in the world, it's now out there, it's now in the file of the attackers, right? It didn't, my, the strong password didn't protect me at all. So there's really a lot of stuff that's back to front. And I think it's just no surprise, you know, that you know, people can't think it's a joke. Right? So, so the whole idea of, you know, that basically that we need to preach to people awareness, that we need to nudge them into behaviors that, that actually aren't really working. Um, is, 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 is really quite sad, you know. So, um, I think we've, um, one of the things we've looked at is provided we get through the massive job of clearing up security first, we need to then look at how we can change behavior. And that, what we have to acknowledge here is awareness is only the first step. We've got very bad widespread security habits and to shift those habits, you can't just throw information at people, you need to really work through a proper, through a program. Um, and this is uh, from a white paper which we will shortly release, working with those colleagues and saying like, you know, uh, currently a lot of companies think you just do this on the cheap, online training, make people go through, uh, read through it and do multiple choice once a year, that's not it. You know, you really need to, to get the, the awareness, the understanding and knowledge to them and then you need to support the whole behavior change part, which, um, so this is not something that a company can do on the cheap. Anybody who works in organizational psychology knows that change requires significant investment and, and doing things properly. So shifting from those, those routine behaviors until the point when the new secure behavior becomes the routine behavior and isn't, um, isn't an effort. That is, I think you're looking in, in a company, given that you can't do all 450 policies at the same time, you would do top three, then you work down to the next one. So you're looking at a change program of two to three years, really, to turn around from the current point. So there's a lot of work to do and a lot of help will be needed. I think the other part is that the schizophrenic attitude also needs to be given up. You know, in how many companies is actually security a key performance indicator? Is part of the psychological contract. You know, if you if you join a major organization today, they will communicate to you very clearly that it's not acceptable to bully your colleagues. You know, that sexual harassment is utterly unacceptable, and so on. But nobody talks about information security, online behaviors, um, except for a few companies that where data protection, sensitive customer data are a key part, and where that would, in the financial industry, for instance, be discussed but it really needs to become part of that, that wider, wider contract. And there's really sort of like a whole uh, bunch of organizational changes um, that, that would need to, to happen in order to turn the behavior around. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is, um, with the greatest respect to our excellent presentations that we've had already, probably the one that I've been looking forward to the most. <laughs> he is Assistant Professor Daniel Efron of the London Business School and his research examines the psychological processes that will allow people to act unethically without feeling unethical. Um, he also researches how people form judgments of others' wrongdoing. We're currently lucky to be working with Daniel and Alex on a trial with West Midlands Police, um, and we're very much excited about the future possibilities of apply applying some of his research to um, crime and justice. So please welcome to the stage Assistant Professor Daniel Efron. Thanks very much. Thanks for sticking around for the session. Uh, can I get my slides up here? I think this is maybe a different deck than uh, that I prepared. Um, but I'll go ahead and start. Uh, in order to prevent crimes, it's very helpful to know, uh, to be able to predict when these crimes are likely to occur. Uh, organizations that like to prevent crimes in the community, like the police, or companies that want to prevent unethical behavior among their, uh, among their ranks, 
uh, often have limited resources to deploy to monitor people's behavior. So are there any behavioral insights that can help us know uh, when best to deploy these resources, when crimes or, uh, so forth are more likely to occur? Well, today I'd like to talk about uh, one behavioral insight that comes from some laboratory research I've been conducting uh, with my colleagues Chris Bryan and Keith Mernian. The kind of situation we're interested in are situations in which people know that they're going to face multiple opportunities to lie, cheat, and steal. But these opportunities they know are going to be limited. So for example, uh, a cashier may realize that she has uh, multiple opportunities to steal a little bit of money from the till. She can do this at the end of every day, but only so long as her boss is out of town. Maybe her boss is out of town for five days, that gives her five opportunities uh, to steal. Um, maybe you like to download uh, music and movies illegally, but you find that your preferred service for doing this is going to be shut down at the end of the week. You now have a limited number of opportunities to download as much as possible. Uh, or maybe you find out that uh, an insurance company is going to start subjecting its claims uh, to more scrutiny, uh, giving you only a limited number of opportunities to kind of pad your insurance claims when you file them. So in situations like these, how do people behave? Uh, how much will they lie, cheat, and steal, and when? Well, if you went to uh, Dan Ariely's talk uh, this morning, you're probably on board with the idea that the average person might be a little bit dishonest, but not as dishonest as they could be. But that still leaves us in the dark about uh, when people have multiple opportunities. Can we predict when they're going to act dishonestly? Uh, at random intervals at the beginning, at the middle? Uh, my colleagues and I predicted that people are more likely to cheat at the end of these series of opportunities to cheat. So if you have multiple opportunities to lie, cheat, and steal, you're more likely to seize the last one. Now why would this be the case? Um, well, let me start with the observation that uh, people are more likely to cheat to get stuff that they really want compared to stuff that they only kind of want. If you went to Bob Cialdini's talk, uh, you're probably on board with the idea that people really want things that are scarce. Right? Marketers know this. You often hear appeals like, for a limited time only, or get yours now while supplies last. So if you have multiple opportunities to get something you want, and then you get to the end, by definition, future opportunities are scarce. So your desire to get that thing should increase at the end of the series. That's going to be particularly tempting. So much so that people may be more likely to cheat to get it. So what I'm claiming is that if you have multiple opportunities to be dishonest for personal gain, it's going to be really tempting to take one of those opportunities at the end. And you might think, mm, if I passed up that opportunity, I would really kick myself for missing that last chance to cheat. Now, we've done some preliminary work trying to capture this idea in uh, some laboratory studies. And today, I'll share two of those studies with you. We refer to this phenomenon as the cheat at the end effect. So in a first study, we recruited a bunch of people uh, from an online subject pool. And we told them about a coin flip task. Now, there was a little bit of deception in this study. We uh, told people falsely that we were studying psychokinesis, the ability to control objects with your mind. We told them, find a coin. They're in the privacy of their own homes. We never meet them. We can't verify what they're doing. Find a coin, flip it several times. Using your mind powers, try to get that coin to land on heads. Now, we want to be sure that you're properly motivated to do this task. So every time you tell us the coin lands on heads, we'll give you 10 cents. Uh, if it lands on tails, we'll give you nothing. Uh, 10 cents is actually, I should mention, um, a pretty big incentive for these participants. They're agreeing to uh, complete the study for as little as 30 cents. So this is increasing their pain. Now we tell them, look, we're skeptical about psychokinesis. And it's really important to us that we don't get any erroneous data. So uh, we know that you could tell us you flipped heads when you really didn't but please don't cheat. Even a small amount of cheating would compromise the integrity of our data. So then people have uh, at least 10 opportunities uh, to flip this coin, and they tell us whether they got heads or tails. Now, it's impossible for us to tell whether any one individual cheated, because they're doing this in the privacy of their own homes. But we can measure cheating in the aggregate. If everyone were honest, then 50% of the time they should say they got heads. More than 50% of people say they got heads, a little bit of cheating is going on. Now, we're interested in whether people will cheat at the end of this series. So we had them do this task under one of three <coughs> conditions. 
So about a third of people, people were told, you're going to have 20 opportunities to flip the coin. Another third were told, you'll only have 10 opportunities to flip the coin. And others were told, the number of flips you have will be randomly determined by a computer, so you don't know. <laughs> what we're interested in is the percentage of people reporting that they got the winning outcome, heads, on flip number 10. Now, everyone completes at least 10 flips, but only in one of these three groups of participants is flip number 10 <laughs> the last one. So we're hypothesizing that people are more likely to cheat on flip number 10 when they think it's the last one than when they think more flips remain. So to preview the results, that's what we find. But in case you're uh, excited about data like I am, I thought I would put up a graph of the results. So uh, the y-axis here is the percentage of people saying they flipped heads. Percentages larger than 50% indicates that some people probably cheated, unless, of course, psychokinesis is real, which I'm not sure it is. Uh, so let's first look at uh, people who said that they flipped heads on the 10th on the flip. So when people think that flip number 10 is not the last, we see a little bit of cheating, not all that much. You know, numbers slightly higher than 50%. But in the condition where people thought that flip number 10 would be their very last one, uh, cheating increases. And another way to look at the data is to examine uh, how many times people reported getting heads on the first nine flips. So one thing to notice is that uh, the groups didn't vary in this. And another thing to notice is if you compare the green bars, you see that people were more likely to cheat on the 10th flip than on their previous nine flips but only when they thought flip number 10 was the last one. So the take home message from all of these colorful bars is just that people were more likely to cheat when they thought they had reached the end of their opportunities to cheat. Now we've uh, replicated this study a number of times using uh, over 2,500 people given uh, more than 25,000 cheating opportunities. And when you do a little bit of math to account for the fact that people will flip heads by chance 50% of the time, our best estimate is that people are uh, almost three times more likely to cheat on the last flip than on their previous flips. But okay, the coin flip situation is a little bit artificial, so we wanted to examine this cheat at the end phenomenon uh, in a laboratory study. Still has some good control, but uh, is more clearly relevant to situations that people face in the real world. This study was inspired by a conundrum that we as researchers often face. We hire research assistants to do tasks for us, and we bill them by the hour. But we can't tell how long they actually worked. So sometimes they'll come back and say, oh, you should pay me for five hours. And I kind of suspect they've taken only three, but I don't know. So in, in this study, we hired participants as temporary research assistants. Uh, again, we recruited them uh, online, so we can't uh, directly monitor their behavior. Um, we told them that we would pay them by the minute to go through a number of essays written by people in our previous studies and assign different codes to them. It's kind of boring work. <coughs> and after they assign a code to each essay, they pause and they tell us how long it took so that we know how much to pay them. Now, we tell them, look, we, we can't tell how long you actually took, but please don't cheat. We're counting on you to be honest. So what they don't know is that we are actually measuring how long they take on the task uh, by, by timing them surreptitiously. So we can tell when people are lying to us. <coughs> the measure that we're interested in is how much people overbill us, how much they say, how long they say they took, minus how long we know they actually took. So. They did this task under one of two conditions. Some people were told accurately that they would complete seven essay tasks, and others were told that they would complete just uh, they would complete ten. Now, again, we're interested in how likely people are to overbill us on the seventh task when they think number seven is the last one, compared to when they think more tasks remain. Uh, so, to preview the results, we do find that people are more likely to cheat at the end. And again, in case you're excited about data, here are the results. The y-axis here is the number of seconds that participants overbuild us for. Let's first look at the seventh essay that they completed. When people expected that number seven was the last one, they overbuild us by a larger margin than when they thought that number seven was not the last one. That's a 42% increase. 
Uh, we don't find differences on the first six essays that they looked at. And if we compare, for example, the blue bars, we see that people are more likely to cheat on the seventh task than on the previous six, but only when they thought the seventh was the last one. So the behavioral insight I'd like you to take away from this talk is uh, very simple. When people face multiple opportunities to get away with cheating, uh, they're more likely to cheat on the last one. Now these are laboratory studies, and it's very important that before generalizing too much, uh, we replicate them in the lab and in the field. Nonetheless, I think these uh, results have some important implications for crime prevention. So sometimes uh, organizations will implement new policies that will make it more difficult to lie, cheat, and steal. These might be policies that increase monitoring or enforcement. It's probably not a good idea to advertise those policies before they go into effect. Advertising them creates the feeling among people that, oh, this is my last chance to get away with lying, cheating, and stealing. We would expect rates of those behaviors to spike. Now, of course, sometimes it's not feasible to avoid people finding out that uh, monitoring is going to increase. And so this research gives us a nice idea of when we should use our, the scarce resources that are available to us to monitor this behavior. So if people know that they're not going to be able to get away with something for much longer, you should probably increase monitoring uh, right before that new policy goes into effect. So ultimately, most people tend to be torn between the desire to get things they want, to satisfy their self-interests, and on the other hand, the desire to feel like a good person. And this research suggests that that self-interested desire might be more likely to win out at the very end. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. I think we've got um, 10 minutes for some questions. Um, I'm going to kick off, if I may. So this question is actually from um, a, ah, there it is, a Home Office official, which was posed to me rather astutely uh, a week ago. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, criminologists such as uh, Ron, Ron Clark spoke a lot about the power of situational crime prevention. Thinking about that in the modern era, is there an equivalent that we could, are there equivalent principles that we could apply to challenges such as online crime, or even more broadly? Yes, uh, so I, I mean, Ron Clark was, uh, Clark and Fertzen were obviously <laughs> pioneers in this area, so I use a model by a colleague, um, Paul Eckblom, and we've collaborated over a number of years, which is, which is slightly more differentiated. So it's basically looking at offender factors on the right-hand side and situational <coughs> environmental factors on the left-hand side. And when you, so he t talks, for instance, about, you know, there's not just the, um, the offender in the situation and the victim, there are often also other people involved, and they can either be crime preventers or crime promoters. And his research in the physical world had basically shown that, for instance, um, sort of like when there are people around that are visible or when there are people around who intervene um, and who are seen to be intervening in, in, in for instance, somebody harassing, um, you know, um, harassing a person, that decreases the likelihood. So if you look in the online environment, um, a lot of these services that, that were being set up didn't take account of, of any of those things. So, for instance, um, on an online social network, there very often is no visibility of anybody actually monitoring that something that's going on. They're also not really kind of like setting um, on the right hand side, not really setting the tone, you know, to basically make clear what actually is a crime or unacceptable behavior. So, um, the, um, for instance, acceptable use policies if it's presented to people at all, it's right at the beginning when you sign up and it's basically 50 pages, you know, full of legalese, nobody <coughs> reads this. Um, and accept it, but they're, they're not repeated to users or they're not made aware of that, for instance, it's, um, it's unacceptable to bully fellow, fellow users of this website, you know, that um, it's, it's, you know, if you look at what Google's doing, it's an absolute doddle to detect um, certain types of language, you know, and you could basically say that, look, you know, I'm sorry, we're not letting you post this type, type of language. So the social network itself doesn't really um, pre present itself as a crime preventer 
um, the capable guardian that, that Clark and Fadson would have talked about. So there is, is when, when we went through the 11 race, you can find something on each of those race that an online platform can do. I guess that could also particularly apply to um, the sharing of indecent images of, of, of underage people online, particularly um, you know, from cyber attacks that may have compromised someone's account in order to get those images to, to start with. Yes. Um, thanks very much. If, um, I may I actually have a, another question, but um, we have time for, I think, three or four. Um, thinking more broadly about some of the behavioral um, insights and behavioral principles that we've spoken about at this conference, this is to anyone who wants to answer. Um, how might we begin to apply these to crime prevention in the modern era more generally? <coughs> well, uh, I've had two epiphanies in my life. The first one was a 15-year cop studying criminology at Cambridge, and I thought, how come I didn't know this when I started the police? Uh, and the other one has been reading some stuff but coming here, uh, and my notebook is full of applications of what I've learned today and how that can be applied in the crime setting. Even just the last question was really instructive uh, as police forces look to channel shift, they call it, over the next five, 10 years with digital engagement. So you will no longer phone up and report your crime, you will engage online to report your crime and it will be uh, for investigations, you'll look remotely on, online. And my question is, how can we apply behavioral insights with that channel shift and get ahead of the curve? But in virtually every application of crime prevention, Victim care, um, behavioural insights have a, a, a profound implication. I think, I, I think the, the most striking uh, moment for me was hearing Don, Dan Kahneman said <coughs> yesterday, uh, consistent with actually a lot of commentary about science, is that we've got to move beyond understanding uh, how people make decisions and try to redesign the whole structure of decision making, um, which was a point that the, the Turning Point Project in um, West Midlands faced in figuring out what to do with first offenders who weren't going to be prosecuted, uh, given a wide range of options for how to try to support them to not offend. And it was only when a doctoral student, uh, Molly Slothauer, got involved in creating a much more effective decision support tool that they stopped coming up with relatively, um, certainly intuitive and not very evidence-based, but certainly not even theoretically guided things like if somebody uh, had a gambling problem and that's why they were stealing, uh, they were supposed to go to a gambling uh, control website and, and read it. Uh, that, that was the sort of unsupported decision that they were making early on. Then with a very clear set of, of options, that some of which were evidence-based, others certainly readily available, more sophisticated uh, treatment for alcohol or drug abuse. Um, once that was provided to the officers, they were making much better uh, decisions. And uh, to the extent that that was working better with violent crime, as uh, Alex uh, suggested it, it was in, in showing the results so far, um, it's a good example of how the whole criminal justice system, not to mention security um, operatives, uh, can uh, try to uh, restrict the opportunities for crime, uh, as, as well as to minimizing um, the repetitions of crime once they do occur, um, by just trying to look in a much more systematic way at how any decision is made. And, you know, when Dan Kahneman was talking about noise, we have so much noise in police deciding to arrest some people or to search some people when two officers would totally disagree uh, about when to do it. And uh, that may, in a way, be the strongest argument for evidence-based practice. Uh, because to the extent that noise has been reduced, and it certainly hasn't been uh, eliminated in medicine, but to the extent that noise has been reduced, it's through things like the National Institute for Clinical Excellence and their protocols for how to deal with uh, certain kinds of uh, diagnostic uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and, and what I think we can aim for, certainly in policing, and I think more generally in, in crime prevention, is reducing noise in decision making, uh, getting more consistent decisions because everybody's on the same page about what works and what is the evidentiary basis we, we need uh, to have what works. But we've got to engineer that back into the decision process. And just training people, uh, or as what Molly was calling, train and hope. Uh, training people isn't enough. We've got to track the decisions they're making and feed back to them when there's noise. And then talk about the noise and keep relentlessly experimenting with not just what is the right thing to do, but how do you get people to do the right thing. Fantastic. Let's open it up.
Um, let's have Netta then Jen. So if passwords are so um, ineffective, and this, as you beautifully established, so widespread, why don't we um, get rid of them altogether? I mean, there are so many more modern security uh, measures, like you know, fingerprints and smart cards, and why? And, and and if it costs so much money, so I'm also curious if there was ever like a cost-benefit analysis of switching organizations into one of these. Before we take that, can we also just take Jen's question? So this may be um, guilty of raising a big question from a small bit of the data, but on the PCSO study, um, on, in the low crime areas where crime increased significantly, and you mentioned that um, you put this down to it being easier to report. I mean, that in itself is a, a relevant behavioral insight, it seems to me. And in terms of preventing crime, really understanding what crime is going on and the quantum of them, those crimes needs to <coughs> partly be about making sure that we can report those easily. Obviously, we have the crime surveys, which tell us more than, than reporting normally does. But how much crime drop do you think might be down to new kinds of crimes which people don't completely know are happening to them, find it more difficult to report, certain kinds of cyber and fraud, and so on? OK, let's just take those two to begin with. Shall we start with the um, question from Netta on why not get rid of passwords? It's, um, it, yeah, it really, it, it beggars belief that it hasn't happened sooner. Um, it's, it's happening slowly, um, so some of the <coughs> consumer-facing um, organizations like, you know, your Googles and Amazons and so on are basically taking certain, um, certain steps. So, I mean, Amazon won't force you to change your password, they're not going to exhort you to, <laughs> to have a strong one. Um, because they take care of it at the back end by monitoring the behavior of accounts very, um, very carefully and only occasionally asking you to provide some additional information if they think there's an increased risk. So they take responsibility rather than preaching to use quite similar with eBay and, and PayPal type things. It's really been more in the corporate sector where, where effectively nobody, you know, nobody seems it's their job to care whether this is, is working or not. So I think one thing to point out here is that security IT security is not a science. And this is, this is at the root, the root of the problem. So a lot of the, the advice you will get, even in a textbook that you teach to students, um, is not based on empirical evidence at all. And a lot of that advice is outdated and hasn't been tested. So security practitioners, the people who make the decision currently, it's a community of practice. And that means your validation, your approval comes from your peers. That means sticking your neck out and making a change and doing something different is, um, is risky, right? Because there is an inertia, there is a pullback, and that's, it takes a brave organization or a brave person to step up and go like, we're going to do something different, we want. And I think basically that's why the shift to uh, evidence-based, you know, is we need the equivalence of evidence-based policing <coughs> in uh, computer security and IT security. We desperately need that shift to happen. And once that's come, and once the economists come in and also help us to actually get proper measurements of the costs and benefit of operating different measures, you know, you need to look at how much does it cost to operate it, but also how much time does it take for my employees, you know, who do I need to employ, and how much do I have to pay the people who are running the system and detecting fraud, and so proper uh, things. That's currently not happening, or only in very, very few organizations. Thank you. Um, the next question was about how much crime, how much can we attribute the crime drop to hard to report crimes? Uh, I think the crime drop is pretty unequivocal. Uh, so both the crime survey and the reported crime figures, although they are different, they show the same trends of reductions in the traditional crimes of burglary, robbery, uh, etc. Um, I think, and I'm just going to hazard an intuitive guess here, uh, that what will become unacceptable in the future, which we should probably do something about now, uh, and have organised criminals moved into something else, so fraud is not accurately recorded at the moment. So everyone who's been subject to a fraud, you bring action fraud, you don't get a crime number, it doesn't get uh, investigated. Uh, at the moment, we are not, as police services across the UK, doing a lot about that. Uh, I think 
in future that will become unacceptable uh, and there will be an expectation. So I suggest that we actually start thinking about doing something about that now. And I know of all the experiments that are taking place in the West Mid, as it picks up on your last point, uh, Ross Ford from the Behavioural Insights team is managing most of the experiments. One of the areas they're really keen to look at is around uh, security and security online, uh, and that's, that, that's being explored, so perhaps we'll get some evidence based around that. Uh, could I just say that the idea of counting crimes makes as much sense as counting the diseases in this country, including every time somebody gets a cold. Uh, it, it's not going to produce reliable estimates of anything that's important, and it diverts us from the more important question of how much harm is being caused by crime, which can't be measured precisely either, but at least we have 400 crime types in England and Wales that have sentencing guidelines that prescribe as a starting point, independent of the characteristics of the offender uh, or, or of the specific offense, uh, we have the number of days in prison that is recommended. And that's the basis of Cambridge Crime Harm Index to multiply the number of offenses of each type by the amount of punishment that society has prescribed through its democratic processes for that particular offense type. If we look at the Crime Harm Index, um, actually, we're, we're confounded by um, the increase in historic reporting of sexual uh, reporting of historic sexual abuse, which has been flooding the um, the counting of crimes in the year in which they're reported. Which I think is another fundamental mistake. It needs to be attributed to the year in which it occurred, and so we wouldn't be seeing this huge increase in rape uh, that's being counted right now uh, as the year in which it's reported, when so much of it happened 10, 15. 20 years ago, or even last year, uh, because of changes in reported behavior. The, the other related issue is that there was a slight change in the counting rules for grievous bodily harm, which has far more extensive punishment than actual bodily harm. That took place around 2008, and it pushed the crime harm index way up, even though the crime count was going down. Um, but even beyond that change, now we are seeing uh, some evidence that if you take the most serious crimes, um, Violent crimes would be about 75% of the crime harm index as opposed to only 15 to 20% of crime counts. Um, there actually is some increase in the crime harm index uh, in England and Wales, and uh, similar work is going on now in Pennsylvania and, and other places. So I think we've got to take that seriously. And finally, there's some estimate that if frauds uh, were counted more completely, that you'd be seeing an increase in the total number of crimes when frauds are brought in. Um, there are 400,000 reported frauds to um, uh, the Action Fraud Center last year in England and Wales. Uh, about 20 to 25 percent of them don't have proper ID as to the address and location. But we're in the process of mapping them with the City of London Police right now to distribute them to neighborhood police teams. So they can be looking at the addresses where perhaps elderly people uh, and others who are more vulnerable to these kinds of frauds could be uh, supported in ways that might uh, go back to the security question of how do you get people to stop being um, so vulnerable to uh, criminal behavior. And, and I think that's the kind of change we've got to look forward to, some of the behavioral insights that we've been talking about in relation to offenders. We might need to start developing in relation to potential victims and, and to, to learn from experimentation what it is we can do to get um, victims to be less likely to be victims. Thanks very much. Unfortunately, we have to break for lunch, but I'm very positive that our um, speakers would be delighted to continue any conversations. Please, can you thank our speakers? The bookshop is about to open. <laughs>